Hey, how are you? I'm Slice of Otaku, and in the world of Avatar, a need for balance is perpetually stressed. Balance is made a central theme whether it be between the nations, spirits and humans, or even benders and non-benders. But despite this, I'd argue that the bending power system is kinda unbalanced, as the discipline of water bending is absolutely overpowered. Now, to be clear, this isn't to say that being a waterbender inherently makes one more powerful than any other type of bender. However, the capabilities of water seem to be as vast as the sea, easily making it the most versatile discipline. In terms of combat, a proficient waterbender may be capable of simultaneously mounting a staggering offense as well as a solid defense. In his fight versus Avatar Korra, Tarlock defends against two pillars of flames with ease, maintaining his defensive positioning as he launches shards of ice at a blistering speed, swiftly shifting the situation into his favor. An approach only quelled by the Avatar's ability to shift from a fiery assault to an earth-based shield. And this duality is one that may only be rivaled by the likes of earthbending, but with that, you end up sacrificing visibility. Which I suppose may be supplemented by the seismic sense technique coined by Toth Beifong, but then again, even disregarding the exclusivity of this move being limited to the Beifong family and those close to them, if a target is nested on anything other than earth, or the terrain happens to be an area of snow, a traditional waterbending friendly environment, you're in trouble. Waterbending also happens to be the only discipline, aside from the rare art of lava bending, capable of freely being phase shifted, and so a watery onslaught may be made into an icy one in an instant. By simply getting a significant amount of water on an opponent, a waterbender has pretty much already won as they can turn that water into ice, serving to immobilize them. And as we see in Katara's fight against Princess Azula, a waterbender can move freely even if completely encased in ice. And to truly depict the levels of absurdity this capability alone may reach, I turn to Book 4 of The Legend of Korra with the battle against the ridiculous giant mech. After many laboring attempts at stopping it in its tracks, the thing that finally stops it is this very move. Korra single-handedly expels tons of water upwards and freezes it. Now, I want you to think about that. Korra does this without the Avatar state, which is to say that just about any proficient waterbender would be able to do the same. This is a feat that no other bending discipline could achieve on the merit of one person alone under normal circumstances. The closest thing to it during this fight is the toppling of a skyscraper, which, mind you, took the combined strength of three very accomplished earthbenders, and even then, it didn't amount to much at all. Now, before we progress onwards to where the scales of balance are completely demolished, it's important that we recognize the supposed biggest weakness of waterbending, terrain. The likes of firebenders and airbenders are generally able to use their abilities wherever, whenever, but earthbenders and waterbenders aren't so lucky. But considering humans are land mammals, ultimately, earthbenders suffer this blow to a lesser extent. You'll often see waterbenders make up for this by carrying canisters of water on their person, which doesn't sound all that great, but consider this. With only such a limited amount of water at their disposal, Somehow, many of them are still capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with any other element on equal footing. I mean, <laughs> that's just absurd. Just think about when they're exposed to more, and this alleged weakness may inversely be seen as a strength. Similarly to our world, the vast majority of the planet they inhibit is made up of water. A learned waterbender can manipulate the water within plant life or even the atmosphere. Unless you're a waterbender, continued combat on the sea without the aid of modern technology is all but impossible. That is a pretty sizable limitation for all other kinds of benders. And the sort of home court advantage waterbenders have with the northern and southern poles is unparalleled. When it rains, waterbenders get a power up. During the night, waterbenders get a power up. During a full moon, waterbenders get a super power-up. The only other discipline that receives any sort of power-up would be firebending, either during the day when the sun is up, 
or once every hundred years when Sozin's Comet rolls around. So unless you're confronting a waterbender in the desert, you may have a hard time putting that weakness to good use. And oh man, even then, there is a busted way of bypassing even that. But we'll save that for last because we still have a long way to go. Waterbenders possess a form of all-purpose healing exclusive to them, and it is truly remarkable. The closest thing we ever receive from any other discipline is the process of acupuncture via metal bending, which only serves to rebalance one's chi. When the Bonti tribe recovered Korra, the elderly shaman used firebending to sense a problem with Korra's avatar spirit, but in the end, they used water to heal her. None of the other elements have anything close to the healing capabilities of waterbending, and this is an art thoroughly taught by the Northern Water Tribe for generations and in the current age is not gender specific. And with Book 2 of Korra, we are introduced to a form of healing specifically for cleansing and calming spirits, which may also be used on multiple targets at once. And as far as we know, this is the only bending technique capable of quelling spiritual aggression. Tenzin, an airbending master who had dedicated his life to such things, had no airbending techniques to contribute. I'd like to believe the other elements would have their own variations, but as it currently stands, that's simply conjecture. What's more, is that this sort of healing also has the ability to damage as you can literally destroy a person's soul. I mean, <laughs> did you hear me? A waterbender can purge your soul. Like, if that's not broken, what is? Well, bloodbending is. Bloodbending is the single most broken and overpowered form of bending in the entire Avatar franchise, and it is a style of waterbending. With the exception of a fellow bloodbender or the Avatar tapped into the Avatar state, no one can truly oppose it. It is such a busted ability that they literally had to sanction it in canon. Bloodbending was deemed illegal, and that's only based on Hama's style, which requires a full moon. Yakone, being a criminal against the law with a lust for power, was able to not only bloodbend at any given time, but do so with just his mind. And with this ability, Yakone, by his lonesome, incapacitated an entire courthouse, the chief of the Southern Water Tribe, one of, if not the greatest earthbenders in history, and the Avatar all at the same time. I mean, come on. This power was so overwhelmingly dangerous that Yakon had to have his bending taken away like Fire Lord Ozai. And even then, Amon took bloodbending to the next level by taking the bending of others away similar to the Avatar. His power was so crazy in fact that he is the only major villain in the entirety of the franchise to not get a true final fight. When he was exposed as a fraud, he fled, but during his time, there was not a single person in existence that could handle him in a fight. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, Slice, come on, bloodbending is super rare, is it even worth factoring into all this? Well, yeah, since the only reason it's rare is because it's illegal. You may not obtain Amon levels, but with enough training, even someone like Tarlock, who was by no means a prodigy, could take out almost anyone in the world. Waterbending really is crazy, so it's no wonder why the main antagonists of Korra books 1 and 2 were all waterbenders. There is just so much you can do with it. I mean, by far, it has the most techniques in the series. Moral of the story, waterbenders have drip and everyone else has zip. Hopefully you enjoyed the video because I am having a blast thinking about Avatar, so you can certainly expect more. This is something I've wanted to do for ages now and since I've recently reconsumed everything the series has to offer, I'm talking all of Last Airbender, all of Korra, every art book, and all the comics. I am finally ready to make my move. Let me know what you think about everything waterbending in the comments, and if there's anything you specifically want me to cover with the Avatar series, be sure to let me know. I already have a ton of things planned, but I'm for sure open to more. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching, and have an awesome day. I love you.